message the Antichrist, Armageddon, and the mark of the beast. Now that's a big, big subject. I hope before I'm finished, you will never again in your lifetime worry or fret about the Antichrist, Armageddon, or the mark of the beast. You know, the more perilous times become, the more interested people become in pr prophetic events. I, I started glancing through these books uh, of these prophecy experts, and no two agreed. Some are pre-trib, some are mid-trib, some are post-trib. And there were some believe that Jesus is coming before the Great Tribulation and we're going to escape all the suffering. Some believe we're going to go through three and a half years of what is called the seven-year Great Tribulation or Jacob's Trouble. And then at three and a half years, I don't know the scripture on that, but they, 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 Jesus is going to come then. Others that we're going to go through all of this, and uh, including the mark of the beast and everything, and at the end of all times, Jesus will come. And in fact, some people that write to me now are very insistent, Pastor David, you've got to tell us whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. And, and, and one or a few said, if you are not pre-trib, we do not want to receive any more of your mail. We can't accept any word you say. They are so locked into a position on all prophetic events that, that you can't talk to them. Now, let me tell you what I believe. Listen closely before I go any further. I believe that Jesus Christ can come at any moment. I believe he can come in a twinkling of an eye. Now, listen very closely. He can come at any moment in a twinkling of an eye, he says. I believe that we're to be ready and expecting him. He said he's coming for those who look for him. I have expected his coming ever since I was a child and knew anything about it. When I, I've told you that every time I heard a trumpet, I stood at attention because I thought that was it. The Bible said he's coming when we least expect him. I don't think anything else has to be fulfilled. He can come, he can come today, he can come any time, but the saints will not be caught unaware because they're to be ready at any time. But I also believe that Christians are going to endure a great amount of suffering before even Jacob's struggle or the tribulation. There could be a series of years of worldwide depression and great suffering. We don't know when the tribulation period will begin. In fact, we, we know very, very little about these things because many of these things have been hidden by the scripture. <clears throat> in Afghanistan, in certain African nations, in Iran or Iraq, Christians right now are being mutilated. They're being beheaded. They are being cast out of their homes. They can't get a job. Their, their children are being taken from them and you ask them about the great tribulation, they'll tell you they're in it. Now, God is meeting many of these. And, and folks, if you went to Indonesia today, if you went to some of these countries, even though there is bloodshed and Christians are paying with their life, you will find one story after another. It would be another book of Acts. You would hear of deliverances that were incredible. <clears throat> How God is providing food and shelter and everything else. And yet there is suffering. <clears throat> Even while I speak now, there are multitudes of God's saints around the world to whom the Antichrist, Armageddon, and the Mark of Beast don't mean anything at all. You go to Afghanistan and you, you try to talk to some of those underground Christians about the Antichrist, and they'll tell you that the Antichrist spirit right now is in control in their country and that they are, un they are fighting and resisting Antichrist right now. You go to other countries and, and you can talk about a beast, you say, and they'll tell you we have a beast in our government right now, a beast who's out to destroy every Christian in the nation. You talk about a future battle of Armageddon and they'll tell you a battle of Armageddon. We're trying to have, we have a war here just to survive day by day. You talk about the mark of the beast to many Christians right now, they say, what does that mean to us? We don't have anything to buy or sell. There's nothing to buy or sell. Now, I'm not ridiculing prophecy specialists or property, prof, prophetic conferences because God has promised not to leave his people in the dark. He said he does nothing except to reveal it to his prophets. But I believe there's a great grief in the heart of God when his people look so intensely into the future they refuse to look at the present condition of their own hearts. They're so set on the future so desirous to accumulate prophetic knowledge about future events 
that they can just drift away from the intimacy of Jesus Christ and sit in front of a television set like a, a couch potato talking about Armageddon. Folks, even the secular world is getting into the prophetic chic. Movies on Armageddon. Hollywood is trying to capitalize on this, this focus on biblical prophetic events. Too many Christians are talking about a coming devil incarnated man of sin. And they're not dealing with the sin of their own hearts. Now, do I believe that there's going to be a devil possessed man who comes to power in God's set time called an antichrist? Yes, I do. There will be a man who uh, totally represents the antichrist spirit and accumulated year after year accumulation of this spirit until it uh, there's an apex till there's a period of time where this spills over and the devil himself incarnates a man called the man of sin I believe that but having said that I want you to know the Antichrist is here now the Antichrist spirit it's very clear in the scripture furthermore the scripture says the Antichrist spirit is at work ever since the cross Listen to this in 1 John, little children, it's the last time. Folks, it was the last time when John wrote it. Can you imagine? This is the last of the last times. As you've heard that Antichrist shall come. I say even now, there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it's the last time. And John tells us plainly to beware of the Antichrist among us right now. Not some future Antichrist, but the Antichrist right now. He said, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and this is the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? The Antichrist among us now, the Antichrist spirit are those who do not believe that Jesus Christ was God in flesh. They are those who teach even in our churches today. 40% of our denominational pastors don't even believe in the virgin birth. They do not believe that Christ was God. Antichrist is here at work now trying to tell you that you can honor Jesus as a good man, as a teacher, as a charitable man who would give his very life because he cared for people. Many, many books are written by that. And many Christians are buying this. Blasphemy. And even in the prosperity of the gospel, some have wondered why all my ministry, I have been standing up against the prosperity gospel. It's because they have been taking away the Godhood of Jesus Christ. That Christ went into, that we are all Christ. That Christ went and subjected himself to the devil and had to fight his way through. That is blasphemy. This, this spirit is already in the land. It's in the world today, the spirit of Antichrist. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is Christ is come in the, that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God and this is the spirit of Antichrist where have we heard that it should come but even now is in the world he said you've heard of an Antichrist coming he says get your eyes off of that man look around you the Antichrist spirit is all around you right now trying to rob you of your confidence that Jesus Christ that you serve to whom you've given your life is God in the flesh because when you don't see him as God in the flesh you have no protector you have no God the Antichrist spirit is not in the homosexual hangouts it's not in the drunkards bar room it's not in the halls of Congress or education it's in the backslidden sin condoning perverse and excusing lust laden church the backslidden church with its backslidden pastors are preaching antichrist now do i also believe that there's a battle called armageddon to be fought in the mid east in a particular geographic location yes i do there's going to be a gathering of nations just as the bible predicts revelation 16 13 beginning to read i saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, there are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth, of the whole world, and gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Folks, this is God's battle. It's not man's battle, it's God's battle. And he, God, by his spirit, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Folks, 
this last great battle between God and the nations of the world is not my concern. And it should not be your concern either. And folks, why should I concern myself about a battle that's out in the future when I've got a battle in my own heart? Folks, the Armageddon's right here. The beast is right here. It's not out there. Everybody, the, 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 these books, whole books on the beast, from Prince Charles to whoever, the beast is right here. The old man, the sin nature. The real war is right here in my heart and in your heart. The Puritan theologians believed that Armageddon was a symbolic battle, a battle of the soul of the bride of Christ, that the devil was coming after the soul of the bride of Christ, and that was the great battle of Armageddon. And folks, I believe that over the past 2,000 years since the cross of Jesus Christ, there have been thousands of Christians who studied uh, Armageddon, and they studied Antichrist, and they, right, they, they were absolutely consumed with these prophetic events, but they went to hell because they lost the battle of their own heart. And what, what good is it to study all your life and accumulate all this knowledge if you lose the battle right here? What sense is it? What is it? What, what if you can go from conference to conference? And I know preachers that read nothing but prophecy books, and I mean, they are experts. They can tell you every little detail. Of course, it's their own, seen through their either the pre-trib or post-trib, whatever it is. They're, they're seeing through these eyes. But why teach it and preach it if you become a drifter away from the intimacy of Christ and you fall into the jaws of lust? And you become cold and lukewarm and you die in apathy. What, what value is it? The Bible says, 1 Peter 2, 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against your soul. You see, you've got a battle, and it's a lust battle. And you people, we heard this morning from Pastor Carter about television. What, what, what about those movies you're running? And you, you're feeding that. You're losing the war, folks. you got Armageddon in your soul. Let's talk about the mark of the beast. Now, this is a prophetic event that's brought so much fear and confusion to the body of Christ. And now we're being inundated with all these ingenious, confusing explanations and speculations about what that mark is. Now, now think about the horror of this whole thing, This, how horrible this whole event is not being able to buy or sell without a mark on your foot or your hand, not being able to function in any nation on earth, no food, no transportation, no way to make a living without the mark. And it conjures up among Christians the, the, the fear that they're going to end up as beggars or living on miracles. And, and, and I believe God is going to create great miracles. He always has. But the, there's this fear. Well, uh, if I'm going to have to take the mark of the beast, and, and nobody gets the mark of the beast unless they're worshiping the beast, unless they're worshiping the Antichrist. <clears throat> and we now we have... There, there, there's one book that, that was given to me. It's a book on instructions for the people left behind. The, the book suggests that Christ comes before all this happens, and, and I believe he comes before the mark of the beast, but this particular book is saying, don't take it because there will be tribulation saints come out of this tribulation who, who refuse to worship the antichrist system of the beast and refuse to take the mark and somehow they survive or they die or they starve or however it is and, and they have overcome. And the Bible does <coughs> say, if any man worship the beast in his image, and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall be the same shall drink of the wrath of God. In Revelation 15:2, there's a reference to those that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. They're standing in the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Now, let, let, let me stop here and give you something out of my heart. I think it's absolutely unbecoming of Christians, and I think it's a reproach to the house of God 
when, when Christians argue so much among themselves about the tribulation and about future events, just absolutely argue and get set on something and say, this is the way it is, and that's it. Now, folks, you ask me, Brother Dave, are, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? You haven't told us yet. I am what I call we can't lose trib. Now, let me tell you why. There, those that, that preach post-trib and, and some of these other things, they have many, many scriptures, many convincing scriptures, and they're godly people on all sides. But here's what, here's what I, I, I've come to. It doesn't matter to me. No matter what, God has given me a covenant promise that the Holy Ghost will never leave me as an orphan. He's going to go with me through fire, through flood, and through famine. He's going to sustain me even in the midst of depression and disaster. He said he would empower us to stand up against every, even the devil himself. And if he can empower the Hebrew children to go through the fire furnace, if he can empower Daniel to go through the lion's den, he can empower us to, to refuse anything of the devil, to go through anything that the devil would try to throw against his bride, and in the process grow stronger. While so many Christians are focusing on Antichrist and Armageddon and the mark of the beast, a very more important prophetic event is taking place right now and most of the prophecy preachers and writers and so forth don't even see it. There's, there's a more intense, present, immediate prophetic event before the tribulation, before the Antichrist, before the mark of the beast, before all of this. There is a very important prophetic event that's happening. Even as I speak to you right now, the whole world is falling into an economic depression. And I want you to look at, at, at the timeline, less than one year. And God said, I have a controversy with any nation, any people who touch my bride. And here in America, we are being chastised now because we have people trying to make it politically correct to choke everything that has to do with the reality of Jesus Christ every kind of rule and legislation my goodness now trying to get God off our coins can't even hang a, a plaque on a wall uh, ha having nothing but a commandment on it bring condoms and everything in the school but throw God out you better believe he's got a controversy concerning Zion you better believe it and until America's leaders get its hands off the chokehold on the church we're going to keep being judged. But folks, listen to me, please. Yes, a worldwide chastening before wick for wickedness and violence, that's part of it. God's vengeance against nations that stand against his holy people, yes, that's part of it. But God has shown me something. And I want you to listen closely as so you've not heard this before. Christ, here is the real bottom line, so to speak. Here is the real reason why suddenly all over the world we are sliding into depression and chaos. Christ is taking his chosen into a wilderness one last time as a last opportunity to find a people who will fully trust him as their Lord, Savior, and provider. Now follow me, please. What could be more clear than we are living in the last of the last days? But there is a glorious promise that God has in this book that still lays unclaimed. Many, many years ago, God took a chosen people into a wilderness. He chose these people. He took them in the wilderness and he took them there for one purpose. He was looking for a people that would fully trust him as provider. He took them out, stripped them of everything that human, humankind could depend on for resources. Stripped all the resources. Put them in a wilderness where there was no food, there was no water, there was nothing to live on. They were stripping of their homes, their houses, their careers, their jobs, their incomes, everything. God says, I'm taking you into a wilderness. I'm going to strip you of every resource. I'm going to call you to my heart. I'm going to make you an everlasting promise that you can go through any trial without any visible means of support. And I will be your God. I'll be your resource. I'll be everything. Failed because of unbelief 
after miracle of deliverance, after miracle of deliverance, after God providing food from heaven and ravens falling from the sky and providing water out of a rock every time another crisis came. Can God do this? Unbelief. So the promise was never accepted. It was still on the table. And even in David's time, even in David's time, there remained a rest, unclaimed. God has always been looking. Since Israel, he's, uh, the reason he chose Israel, he is looking for a people who he could look on with rejoicing and say, he trust me, she trust me, I found somebody. I found somebody believes I'm God. I found somebody not living in fear. I found somebody not murmuring and complaining. I found somebody that believes I can be a provider. He wanted to be such a glorious God of deliverance to these people. But I believe God grieves even greater over what he sees in his church today. Over his own beloved people. Even those who claim to be intimate and loving with him. We have so many people just like the disciples. We doubt him even when he's in the boat. I can only surmise what the Lord sees when he looks on his church today. What does he see? I'm afraid he sees a people, a multitude of people who worship, praise him, magnify his name, but go home and fret and worry about maintaining a prosperous lifestyle. A people growing indifferent and apathetic, wrapped up in so many activities that they have no time to seek the face of God anymore. And furthermore, and probably worst of all, a people crying and praying for revival for no other reason but to appease God to keep up our lifestyle. How many are praying, revival, Lord, send revival. That's so that an angry God would be appeased and I don't have to let go of my things. Christians scrambling to find money and resources to survive. Worrying about Social Security and retirement. Worrying about their mortgages and their investments and full of anxiety and fear. As if our security depended on our wit and our wisdom. Listen to me please. The most present prophetic event in God's calendar. The next thing on the calendar is a worldwide depression. This is the next thing and in it and the cause of it and the reason God's doing it now and quickly because I believe his coming is so soon and he is going to take his bride into the wilderness and once again strip the church of Jesus Christ of all of its human resources back again into the wilderness of depravity. I'm not saying that, he, that you're going to be a beggar. I'm not saying anything. You and I, are every we're, we are going to wake up one day in a different world soon. And it's not going to be like it's ever been before. It will never come back to what it was and is now. It's going to be a changed world. Folks, listen to me closely. He is bringing his people into a last day wilderness experience. He started his church that way. He's going to end it that way. It started in the wilderness. It's going to end in the wilderness. This generation has never had to trust God. Have your children ever had to trust God? You've supplied everything your kids have. They want sneakers. They don't want $30 sneakers. They want $150 sneakers. Here, honey, MasterCard, go get it. Anything we want, get it. You know we don't even have repairmen left in America because anything breaks down, we throw it away and buy it new. It's all going to change. It's all going to change. This generation has not had to pray for daily food. We've lived in such abundance. But soon, very, very soon, you and our children, you and I and our children are going to have, we're going to be thrust into to this new world, deprived of all of the abundance we now have. And folks, it's not because God's angry with this bride, not at all. He said, I'm doing this to woo her back to me. He does it out of love. In this economic collapse that's coming, in this time, God says, I'm going to bring you away from all of these things that have taken your heart. Can you, can you imagine a time when you won't be able, we, no Christian will be able to afford monthly payments on internet? There goes the internet sex. There goes the hours wasted. 
watching knowledge of nonsense. You can't go to the movies anymore. You don't have money for frivolous things. And, and, and suddenly, meeting with the bridehood, going to church becomes the highlight of your life, being a part of the body of Christ. And now you have time to pray. And the reason you have time to pray because you're praying in your daily necessities. That's what happened in the wilderness. God said, I'm going to allure you. But he says, I'm going to teach you to praise me and love me like you've never praised me and loved me before because I'm going to give you the true vineyards. And the Valley of Acre is going to be a door of hope. You're going to sing that. Our hope is there. If a revival comes to the church, it's coming in the wilderness, in a valley of scarcity. When people are driven to their knees. You're not going to be talking to your psychiatrist about your hang-ups anymore. You're not even going to talk about how you were abused 40 years ago. You're going to be on your knees. Oh, God, I believe you for our next day's meals. Look at verse 19. And in the wilderness, he's talking about, And there I will, what, betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercy. I will betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. You'll know him as you've never known him before. He said, there was a time you loved me with all your heart. There was a time you treated me like a bridegroom should be treated. There were no other lovers. You were faithful to me. He said, I'm going to take away all of your other loves. I'm going to isolate you all to myself. He said, there I'm going to reveal my love to you. And I'm going to get back the tenderness from you that I've longed for. And he said, you and I are going to get to know each other again before I come. You're going to know who I am. He's going to woo us in the wilderness. Now, I I can prove this even further, but I'm going to close in just five minutes. But I want you to go to Jeremiah 2, please. Jeremiah 2. Jeremiah 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espouses, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in the land that was not sown. Look at me, please. He's talking to a people who backslidden. And he's come to, he says, and God's speaking through Jeremiah, he said, I remember what it was like when you had nothing, when you weren't wallowing in prosperity, how you went after me. And he said, I took you into wilderness that was not sown. You know what he's saying, not sown? There was no grass, there was no grain, there was nothing anywhere. It was not sown, it was a dry, empty place. And yet, you loved me at that time with tenderness. You had a heart for me. And you went after me. I was the goal of your life. I was everything to you. Everything. In a barren wilderness, not sown, you had become my bride. You loved me tenderly. You pursued my heart. And it was a place of total scarcity and barrenness. You had no human resources, but you didn't care because you were in love with me. The priest said not, where is the Lord? They that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that are not right. And folks, this is exactly what's happened to our generation. Prosperity has robbed us of our passionate love for Jesus. It has destroyed many pastors. It's made a mockery of holiness. God's blessings have been taken for granted. Every man is out for himself, and the nominal church, including the nominal pastors of the denominations, many become lazy and corrupt and blasphemous against God. You know what the Holy Ghost is trying to do? He is, he is trying, and, and I'm hoping the book that God's put in my heart will, will just absolutely smash the fear. Drive it out of your heart. Absolutely drive it out of your heart, because... The Lord said you're going to the wilderness, but, but that's going to be where he reveals himself to us. That's where the fellowship is going to be. That's where the miracles are going to be. This is where the grace. And, and he said, that's where you're going to sing. You think you're singing now. Wait. 
He said, you're going to sing in the wilderness. All right, here we go. I'm going to read all the way down. Let's read the whole chapter. All ten verses. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Where? In a solitary wilderness. Strengthen the weak hands. Confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, the tongue of the dumb sing. And in the wilderness shall waters break out in streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, the thirsty and springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass and reeds and rushes. And in the highway shall be there, and a way it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The way for a man, though fool, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, no ravenous beast shall go therein. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. The ransom of the Lord shall return. Come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall tame joy and gladness, sorrow and sighing shall flee away in the wilderness. Raise your hands and thank God for the wilderness. Lord, I thank you for the wilderness. We shall not be afraid. Lift up your hands, you said. Be strong and fear not. Fear not. Fear not. We fear not. Hallelujah. God, remove all fear from your overcoming church. Lord, there ought to be a lot of fear in the sinner and the backslider. A lot of fear because things are going to get so panic. There's going to be such panic. The Bible said their hearts will fail them for fear. Many will die of heart attacks. But, oh God, you're going to have a church here in Times Square. They're going to shout without fear.